okay, so thank you. But uh, yeah, so my name is uh, John Paul Brown. I'm a little, uh, well, I won't say. Uh, I was okay. gonna, I'll tell a little secret there at the end about my career. And we tried this earlier and it, it's it's not working. I saw it. Is it working now? Very nice. I think. I think it was working literally like 10 minutes. No, IT guy was in here and it was clicking before everybody got here. I slept these slides. Oh, yeah. Maybe we want to get out of your venue or something. There it there is. Go. Okay. Yeah. So, as I said, my name is uh, John Paul Brown. I own uh, what is now Elope USA LLC. Uh, when I first created it, it was simply just Elope Asheville in 2010. I, we call it Elope USA LLC because we've expanded into five different locations uh, throughout the U.S. and in Ireland. So um, every year we do between 350 to 400 elopements just in the Asheville area. Um, in October alone, this past October, we've done right about 60 weddings. So um, it was kind of, uh, if, if I would have known that the Smart Series presentation was going to be on November 1st, I probably wouldn't have submitted it. But uh, because I'm kind of uh, exhausted. Last year, I'm pivoting uh, my 13 plus years of experience in planning elopements into becoming a business consultant to help people throughout the United States to start their own elopement business exactly as I have. And I offer the full solutions of I get the website up, do full training, pricing, um, contracts, everything that they need to get their business up and running. Um, so that's going pretty well kind of exciting. I'm meeting people from all over the U.S. who have wondered if this works and I get them up and running and they get their investment back. I call it an investment in themselves. They get their investment back within five weddings usually and then they're off and running and, and doing amazing things. So this I'm married to Crystal and if you listen to 105.9 The Mountain in the morning, Rick and Crystal, she's the Crystal of the Mountain. Uh, just uh, mid-September, we went to Vegas to do a little business research and went to a wedding chapel. So that's us uh, getting married or renewing our vows with uh, little Elvis. And so that was a lot of fun. I learned a lot of stuff being on the customer side. If you can ever go somewhere and be a customer in your industry, you'll learn a lot of stuff. So I thought that was a lot of fun. We have four kids, three 10-year-old girls and a 14-year-old boy. Uh, I have twins, she has another one, and that's the three 10-year-old girls, and she has a 14-year-old. So I do take donations in advance. <laughs> so I, I created this uh, this idea for this topic. You, like you said, it, it kind of, it's a different way of talking about leadership. <laughs> a lifelong role in leadership positions. I started out in Boy Scouts whenever I was little, you know, Cub Scouts. And went on to Weevilos and Boy Scouts. I got my Eagle Scout Award. Um, started you know, doing leadership roles in different organizations I was with, with um, local kind of government things. Back then, the D.A.R.E. program type stuff. Uh, going on and into college, taking student leadership roles. Um, went into the military. And I mean, that's all about leadership. They train you about leadership. I was an aviation meteorologist in the Air Force. And so um, when I got out, I was in a corporate field for a short amount of time, and uh, I was a team lead over about 30 people. So kind of leadership has been a my, for my entire life. And I got the idea for this topic about two years ago when I was talking with a friend, and the show I'm talking about will come up later on, but... Um, I made the argument that this person was an exceptional leader, he was really good, and everybody else thought I was a moron for saying that. But I stick to my guns, and I'll talk about why, a little bit why this person or these two people, I think, are exceptional leaders when everybody else just plays them off as being a moron. So today I'm going to talk about the landscape of leadership. This is all kind of the boring stuff when you go to all these presentations at corporate seminars, oh, the landscape of leadership. But I'm going to talk about three distinct leadership styles that came to be in the 1930s, where a guy named Lewin, he researched leadership styles and how people reacted to certain leadership styles. And uh, as any corporate person would appreciate, he tested all of this on little kids. 
So uh, you got a lot of data and, and the data is still being analyzed and discussed to this day. So it's from autocratic to laissez-faire, understanding the spectrum. There's a whole spectrum of leadership styles. And when I talk about those three leadership styles, it goes on and on. I was talking to somebody uh, earlier. It's like 16 now, but they all span it's different combinations. A little bit of this, a little bit of that. Boom, you have a, a brand new leadership style. We're going to talk about the TV characters that represent these leadership styles. And there's a little asterisk there. Um, not always could I find a TV character, so I went into the movies a little bit. Oh, thanks. Oh. <laughs> a little too much. I'll get there. Hang on. Okay. Ooh. That's familiar. Pushing all the buttons. <laughs> all right, I'll start. So my name is Joe Barbara. Um, <laughs> so when identifying your leadership style, uh, style, if you're leading other people, you also need to identify the people that you're leading, their leadership style. And with every leader, there's three things. You either lead, you follow, or you get out of the way. So you have to identify the, the following styles, which almost kind of mirror the same way. If, if you have people who, who love an autocratic type workplace, you have to be that for them. So you have to work the spectrum of being a, a good leader across a wide number of people. So that being said, let's get to the first one, the autocratic leadership style. I say this is the style. If you go into a high school room, and let's say there's 30 people in the room, you pick out a random person, you're the leader, we need a, a big project done by the end of the week. This is what they're going to default to because they don't know any other way. And that makes it sound like it's a bad leadership style. It's good when you know how to wield it correctly. But uh, autocratic leaders make decisions unilaterally. They don't ask anybody for their opinion. They value the control, they value the consistency and the quick decision-making. They don't want any input. They don't want any criticism. They lay it out on the line. So the characteristics, centralized decision-making, <coughs> they all come from the leader. Um, it's, it's just kind of how the autocratic leadership style is all of this stuff. Clear direction, limited feedback. They don't want to know if people don't agree with their, uh, their decisions. Uh, very high expectations usually for this. And the control and authority is uh, kind of a big thing for them. It all comes off kind of negative, but it is needed and required and the best way of leading in certain situations. So whenever things go terribly bad, when the IT goes down, um, when the whole office is online and you have a, a big meeting in 30 minutes, you need somebody to take control real fast and to do it and not ask for their, anybody else's opinions. Um, when it's a brand new group of people, if you have a new team, they come in, you don't know anybody, you kind of have to be that guy until you get to know everybody's strengths and weaknesses. And in industries and projects where precision <laughs> and consistency are crucial, such as the military. A lot of people recognize the autocratic style being military leaders, uh, drill, and so uh, drill sergeants, things like that. So that's when it's going to be needed. And uh, pitfalls. So this is when we're talking about that study in the 1930s with Lewin. He got a group of kids in the room, and he had a leader who was very autocratic and uh, told them exactly what to do, how to do, when to do it. And they did it. They did really well. They did efficiently until the guy or the girl, whoever it was, left the room. The entire place fell apart. Uh, bullying started taking over. Uh, no work got done. It, it just completely fell apart without that top autocratic leader in there. So that is a pitfall. If, if you're an autocratic leader and you're out sick for a week, you're probably not going to get much done unless you assign someone to be that guy. Um, and nobody's going to like you. If, if that's <laughs> lot, uh, high turnover, burnout. So, fictional examples. This was the hardest one to find TV characters for. But I did find one that was on TV. Anybody know him? Game of Thrones? Yeah. Uh, what was the one he said? It's like, if you're, if you're the lion, you can't be concerned with the sheep or something like that. Yeah. So, uh, centralizes power. 
rarely seeks counsel, expects unending loyalty. This is the movie I had to go to, Devil Wears Prada. <laughs> um, that was also in an office episode. But, um, and everybody knows the Dark Lord. Uh, very autocratic, and if you don't like his opinion, he'll choke you out. <laughs> so there's real world examples. Oh, <laughs> jobs. Uh, I, this was kind of surprising to me, but when doing research for this, uh, this speech, I didn't know Martha Stewart was kind of seen that way, but there's a lot of articles about how she doesn't take advice to any of her people. She has a vision and she goes for it. Anybody know who the black and white? Ray, Ray Kroc. Ray Kroc, yes. The guy who took McDonald's and made it a production powerhouse. Like, you will do it this way. You will do it that way. And if you don't like it, you can't do McDonald's. Something that's that's a, a pretty great for, uh, for all. And keep an eye on Steve Jobs because he's going to make an appearance once. So then we have the Democratic leaders. This is what all of the corporate planning, all the corporate training goes into training the Democratic leaders. And for the most part, for very good reason, it's because it gets the most production done. Uh, there's a chain of command type thing going on. Democratic leaders are actively involved in team members in the decision-making process. They value collaboration, feedback, collective wisdom before making decisions. So uh, these are the guys that are gonna uh, encourage the team to make suggestions, make recommendations. What should we do next? How should we do this better? Um, has that open door kind of policy that you always hear, hey, uh, yeah, my office is always an open door, come and talk to me. It rarely is. Uh, <laughs> they, they trust their team members. And this kind of bleeds into the next one as well, but they trust their team members to do what they are really good at and to contribute ideas because having everybody involved uh, uh, moves the mission forward. And they're flexible, you kind of have to be. Uh, and so this is kind of interesting, this showed up. Shared responsibility, the success and failures are shared among the team. And if you're the boss and uh, you're the democratic leader and you make a decision that everybody voted for and it goes terribly wrong, it's on you, the, the buck stops here. So it, the, uh, the shared responsibility is very limited if you're the, the main person. It's effective and I, you know they say that 80% uh, and there's the 80 and 20 rule. So 80% is your everyday, your, what you're gonna see the most of the time. And then there's a little 10% of really good and 10% really bad. This is the 80%. This is what you're gonna see in most office spaces. It's a creative industry where, and in most industries really where you need team input. How's, how's the line going? How's sales going? How can we improve it? How can the line go better? How can things be more efficient? You need that constant feedback in order to steer the ship. Um, and you need, to, it's, you need the team to trust you, you need to trust your team. And pitfalls, it's kind of time consuming. You do have to take hours out of the day to do the meetings and that nobody likes. You have to, hours of day, sending out emails and getting feedback and um, talking to uh, you know, your head people. And that takes a lot of time to do. Um, pot, potential conflicts, you could have half the room saying we definitely have to do this and the other half saying we definitely have to do that. And this side saying, if you do that, we're all gonna quit and vice versa. And it can be stressful sometimes. And that's, you know, that's what being the leader, where it really comes down to being the effective leaders, making the choice and risk losing half your team. So fun examples for this, John Luke Picard. <laughs> I like John Luke? I think I know John Luke. This is from, okay. Yeah, yeah. Gotta go with the name trade. Ted Lasso, a little modern example. He has his wolf pack. And uh, what I like about Ted Lasso is not only does he surround himself with people that he really likes and really trusts, he brings people to his inner circle that he has no reason at all to have them there. They, they are anti Ted Lasso. And he brings them in specifically because. He's that other side of the coin. 
if you can find someone that someone like that, not necessarily a, a, an enemy, but somebody who just doesn't like how you run things, get them a little closer to you because maybe they have a point. Maybe there's a little bit of truth in what they they criticize. And it creates that positive, inclusive environment where people can uh, be who they are. And this is, I'm a soft spot for MASH. Uh, Colonel Potter, I love the guy. And uh, he does the same thing. He has his people, he, he, has, a, he has a strong thumb on um, whenever it, it comes down to it. But he also uh, takes the time to ask everybody their opinion and uh, what they think about it. But he doesn't necessarily follow. It's a real world example. Bill Gates, when he was first starting Microsoft, he it was an open environment where everybody contributed and it created what it is today. Martin Luther King Jr., one of the best leaders in the uh, 20th century, one of his hallmarks was getting communities together to all work together to make these radical, amazing changes. Same thing with Nelson Mandela, came out of prison and uh, into apartheid and somehow became who he is by bringing people together. So that's the, the main leadership style of this democratic uh, uh, leadership style. So this is my favorite, laissez-faire leaders. And I tell people whenever I'm coming on to a project, this is my main leadership style. And a lot of people, a lot of higher higher ups don't like it. But it works for me. I've, I've always done it this way. It's just my natural tendency to be the laissez-faire. Laissez-faire leaders provide their teams with lots of freedom in how they approach their work. They offer minimal direct vision and typically delegate decision-making authority. So this doesn't mean they uh, just go in their office and shut the door. They put people in different positions based on what their natural skills and talents may be. Uh, and so that way they know that these people, and they make it well aware, these people can make these main decisions without having to come to him first because he trusts them, they trust him. And if something goes horribly wrong, it still goes back to him. But uh, that's just kind of the, the back and forth relationship that the laissez-faire leader has with his subordinates. Hands-off approach gives team members autonomy in their tasks. We know you're good at what you do, do what you do. They trust in your expertise. Again, do what you do really well and uh, just tell me if there's a hiccup, something's going wrong. Only intervenes when necessary. It's very flexible. They, uh, you can set an overall goal and trust that they're all gonna get there. <laughs> it's effective and when you have a highly experienced, motivated team, um, before I started at Elo Bashwell, I worked for Ally Bank, and I was a team lead for uh, um, about 30, 35 people. And I always got criticized by my boss for having a ragtag group of people who didn't seem to pay any attention to rules. Mm. And uh, yeah, and so but I said, what do our numbers look like? Because we have all these numbers that kind of uh, talk about how we're doing as a team, and our numbers were always so high, much higher than anybody else in the, in the whole building. And it's because I trusted this person to do calls. I trusted this person to do click the chat. I trusted all these people to do what they do. We had one person who I bent the rules for a little bit because whenever he could put music on, he would do the job that nobody else wanted to do. And he'd do it all night. You'd never hear, about, hear from the guy again. And his numbers were always great. So nobody even complained that I let him listen to music in the corner somewhere because he did such a good job. And so I was always criticized for having that ragtag group, but they did a really, really good job. Um, so yeah, it's effective when you know your team really well. And there's definitely a lot of uh, pitfalls, uh, that lack of direction and oversight. A lot of people will think the leader is being lazy and not doing what they're supposed to do, but if you're worried about that appearance, probably not for you. So let's look at fictional examples. So one, I'll, I'll tell you right off, uh, Ron Swanson from uh, Parks and Rec. <laughs> <laughs> he hated the uh, micromanagement. He just wanted people to do their job. The next two 
are who I talked about earlier, the people who I had a debate with saying that I think they're some of the best leaders with, on TV. First one going back to MASH, Colonel Henry Blake. He trusted his doctors to do what they're supposed to do. He trusted Radar to do what he was supposed to do. And they saw them all as lazy and couldn't make a decision. But if you believe in the universe of MASH, the 477 had the best care anywhere. And it, it just worked. And here's the other one. And you're going to moan. You're going to groan. I think Michael Scott was a good leader. Yep. Yep. He was seen as a doofus. But he had everybody in the office doing a, the thing that they are a specialist at. And uh, again, if you believe in the universe of Michael Scott, Thunder Mifflin, Scranton, the best in the uh, in the paper company <laughs> later on. Yeah. What about Bill Murray in Stripes? You gotta dig deep in that one. Yeah. Is that I see what you're saying. Yeah. It's been a while since yeah. I've seen Stripes. They got a job done. Yeah. Well, it's an 80s movie. It's been a while for everyone. Yeah. yeah. And I have a theory on Michael Scott if anybody wants to discuss it with me later I can but um I really think Michael Scott was a good leader in his environment where he was and that he understood his employees and put them in positions so well that everything got done that needed to get done so instead of dismissing them right off the bat yeah he's a doofus but I think he had a really legitimate basis for how he did things and real world examples. We have uh, Richard Branson, uh, Warren, uh, I've got it written down here. What's his name? Oh, Warren, uh, yeah. yeah. And because uh, both of them are very, very notorious, and especially him, he schedules two to three meetings per year. That's all he does. And he's literally the richest man on the planet. And he's not far behind him, and he does it the exact same way. Steve Jobs, you saw him over in the autocratic side of things. And this segues into a whole, the, the, the next section of what I'm talking about. Steve Jobs knew he didn't know a lot of stuff. He didn't, there was a whole lot of stuff he knew he wasn't good at. He was great at business. He was great at getting this corporation off the ground. But what he would do is create departments of phone research, uh, touchscreen research, and just let them go. And what he would do is have, have them come to him. Here's what we found, perfect. Came up with the iPhone, and it's you know it's revolutionized everything, and that's how he worked. Whenever he was, yeah, well, they fired him and brought him back. You know, if he changed his style, I don't think he did. I think he was still the a hole that he always was. The fact that they fired him, saying we don't need him, and realized quickly that then he did done something right. Yeah, because I think, and that's what it segues into. The, uh, identifying the primary leadership style. I think his primary leadership style was the autocratic leadership style. He knew he had the vision. He knew exactly what he wanted and what it would look like. He was cutthroat down to the individual person to get there. So that's your decision-making process. Um, if leadership control is a spectrum, where on that spectrum do you lie? And seek feedback from your peers and subordinates because what you think you are may not always be what everybody else thinks you are. <laughs> they may think you're, well, yeah. Uh, notice patterns in your behavior, all this stuff. So identify who you are as a leader, find your strengths, and as Steve Jobs was, find your weaknesses and change leadership styles based on what your weaknesses are. Because who you put into those other other spots may supplement your weaknesses. And like a, that goes into this, identifying the leadership style of team leaders. Because if you're the boss over multiple team leaders, you have to identify who they are as leaders and work with them. And the big thing is who they are. If it's not who you are as a leader, is their leadership style effective? That's probably the biggest question you can have because that was always my frustration when I was criticized. My leadership style. It's effective. It's working. It works really well. So what's the problem with it? I, I never got a good answer to that, but I never got fired. So <laughs> uh, engage in open dialogue. That's them about their leadership philosophies. That's good to know when you're bringing new people on. Um, are they going to clash with you? Are they going to enhance you? Is it going to be 
something that you just don't understand. How are the people under them responding to their leadership style? Offer, offer leadership training sessions, but if you hire somebody in as a leader, you can't change something that already is. Um, maybe I have a, a weird thing about leadership sessions. There, there are natural leaders and then there's natural followers and both are very important. And I don't think you can budge much on a, a, a natural leader style, but you can definitely, you know, there's always learning to do, always things that you can improve. And then tailoring, uh, tailoring leadership to the end of it, a personalized approach. Sometimes if, if you were the people I was leading on this great mission, who I talked to you may not be how I talk to you, may not be how I talk to you. And if any, everybody has their own individual style, as long as we're not in that, oh my God, we have to done in 30 seconds. You, 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 you know. Um, you have to work with what works with each individual. Because one person may not like the autocratic style. One person may not like uh, telling them, yeah, let's say fairies. Do what you want. Uh, some team members may thrive on autonomy. Uh, others prefer fear the right. And building trust, that's the biggest thing. If your team trusts you and you trust them, magic is going to happen. And doing all this way that uh, unlocks your full potential, because that must be your overall goal in leading your group. Unlock that full potential, unlock that motivation, that drive, and you get the full efficiency out of your team. Conclusion, because I'm hungry, I haven't eaten yet, I didn't want to hurt my stuff while I was <laughs> So diverse styles, one goal. Leadership is not monolithic. Embracing various styles can lead to more effective management and better team dynamic. Oh, and that's me too. Yeah. <laughs> Last falls. Adaptability is key. The best leaders are those who can read a situation and adjust their leadership style accordingly. And that's hard to find, by the way. Uh, continuous learning. It's always a journey. Keep going. Keep reading. That's why we're all here today. I say that's why. The, uh, the smart series asked me to come in and, and talk because it is a constant thing to learn and to improve just as you are as an individual. And by understanding and adapting leadership styles, we empower ourselves and those that we are over. So get that too. Oh yeah, there's another one. <laughs> That's that. <it. laughs> the little secret was... Uh, Honestly, I forgot about doing this speech until last night. Uh, I wrote this whole thing until about four o'clock this morning. So, <laughs> <laughs> so name it. Huh. Yep. What are some actionable things we can do if we recognize that I'm in one of the leadership categories, but I want to move to another category? How can I really, you know, grow into that space? Yeah, I think the theory behind that is. If that's like saying I'm an introvert and want to be an extrovert, or I'm a, a science-minded person and want to become art-minded. I think you're hardwired into a certain thing. There are different ways of growing into it. And I think that's important of watching some of the TV shows with these leaders is instead of looking at people as uh, too harsh and too hard or too much of a doofus or, or, or too, too much considering their their underlings uh, opinions, try to think about it in the other way. It's like, okay, that's interesting. Why did he choose that? Why? Always ask why. Um, why did they go in that route? Why is Michael Scott doing this? Is it a, a team leading thing or is like getting everybody to come together as a more of a concealed group? Um, I think that's the question I always ask when I watch the office It's not, oh, that's silly. It's like, did that really work? You, would that really work in a, in a real life thing? You wouldn't want the uh, HR liabilities that Mike <laughs> Scott has, but I think it's always interesting to watch it. It's like, why did they go with that? And what effect did that have in the long run? So the constant learning thing it involves a lot of what and why and just analyzing it. Any books that you'd recommend if somebody wanted to follow up? Ooh, there is a book on uh, the Jean-Luc Picard 
uh, uh, I think it's like, was it what would Jean-Luc Picard do or, or what would Pat, Captain Picard do or maybe it's the leadership styles of Captain Picard or they miss the leadership and what he's done. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. I'm trying to think. John Maxwell right, has written slews of books on leadership. Oh, John really Maxwell. Good. He's so good. He's Christian based, but he's really good. Yeah, he's really Very good. Very step by step. And that that uh, research that went on in the 30s on, by Lewin, L E W I N. Hmm. Read up to that because it's surprising how certain leadership styles naturally seem to have consequences and effects that have been consistent over all the years. And the research since then have all confirmed it. So read all of his his study, read his study. And he was one of these smart guys who did studies on astrophysicists, astrophysics and human behavior and mathematics. He, he did a lot of stuff. He's a real smart guy. So, uh, there was a, a football coach fired last night that was apparently extraordinary at one thing and terrible at the head coach. Uh, and we see that sometimes where somebody's considered this amazing leader and then goes to a different situation and fails, probably because they can't adapt to that. Like their leadership didn't work with that that team when they were coming in. Do you have any examples of that? Uh, or, or a favorite of that, where oh, because Jobs was there and then he came back, but somebody who switched companies and it didn't go as well the second or third time. Yeah, I'm on the spot. I can't think, of, but it, I, I bet by the end of the day, I could write a list of them. Um, let me think. Yeah, should it always it shouldn't it be the ability to adapt, right? It's like if you start the team, that's different than taking over a team, and you better make sure you don't alienate them more. It should. You'd think on you know. Black and white paper, it should be that way. It's like, oh, he's a good leader here, but not necessarily there. It could be like what he was saying. It's different situations need different leadership styles, and it just didn't didn't translate over as well. That's that the quality of a good leader they can adopt. Right. That's right. It's called make it so make it so make it so. There you go. There you go. It's really good too. <laughs> It seems like the um, <clears throat> laissez-faire leader doesn't necessarily, he's not, he or she is not particularly an expert in any one thing. And it seems like they maybe they're really good at recognizing talent and others and putting that team together. I presume that's a skill, but yeah. are there some other skill as a laissez-faire as leader that stand out to you? I think that the main number one is what you said, where you can look at your team, and it may take a couple of weeks to figure out what does what works where, who does what really well. Um, but the, the laissez-faire guy does kind of have to get along with his team for the most part. Um, if you would, I would say a common negative trait out of all of the ones that I showed was that they all kind of want their people to like them. Uh, Colonel uh, uh, Henry Blake did, Michael Scott obviously did. Uh, not Swanson very much. He didn't care. Yeah, but uh, that's probably a negative trait that's more common. With myself, I like my people to like me. It kind of ruins my day if everybody kind of I go to work and everybody hates me. But uh, <laughs> but like with with my businesses, I spend a lot of money hiring people that I know is going to be really good at this one particular facet. And I, I give them a little bit of training. Here's how you do the ceremony. Here's how you talk to people. And that's it. One of my employees I haven't even seen in a year. Uh, I'll see him for the first time uh, this upcoming weekend, I think. This is the first time I've seen him in a year. But he does great. He does wonderful. No news is good news. Yeah, that's what I think. This is a comment. It's not a question. But Ted Lasso seems like one of his traits. And I know it's TV. It's a little it's Right, very over the top, but yeah. he seems to manage with a lot of compassion and empathy mm -hmm. for others, and that's kind of seems like it, it works for him and maybe work for a lot of other people. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Sure didn't know the business, right? He had to hire people that told him what they were actually doing on the board. right. So he's kind of a mix, I would have stopped right. the, the democratic and the uh, laissez faire. It's just fun saying laissez faire. <laughs> How about this one liner if you could reduce it to? It's a little artificial, but if you if you were to say you're never going to see us again, 
you get to say, hey, if I can leave you with one thing, uh, mm -hmm. that I would encourage, like across all leadership styles, I would really encourage you to focus on this or make sure that you show yourself up here or look out for this pitfall. If you can reduce it to a little minor, that's all you get. What would that be? Mm -hmm. The strongest thing you can do as a leader, I think what you're saying is to be able to diversify on the fly. You could come in having a laissez-faire day. Computers start going down. You need to ask your IT person, all these people, what to do. The whole system shuts down. You have to be able to switch those styles. You can't be a laissez-faire person when all the computers are down. So I think the one thing that's important to be is very flexible and to know when to diversify your skills. So why do you pick that over? It starts with people every time. You know, you pick diversify over. You know what? If you have good people, you're going to look. I mean, regardless of your style, you're going to look great. So well, I mean, you pick diversify over people. I'm just wondering. I would always say hire well, and your job's easier, regardless of your style. That's true, but yeah, they kind of go hand in they hand. Do. Yeah. It's uh. Things happen throughout the day that you're not always know is going to happen. When you're driving to school or driving to work or something, you may get in a fender bender. You know, it's like things change throughout the day, and you have to just as us as normal humans, we have to we go pick up our coffee and towards work. Somebody rams us from the back. You go from autopilot to being having to know. Oh, I've got to call insurance. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. It's as a leader, it's that on a much bigger scale because you have everybody in here, their individual day is kind of in your hands and you have to, if things go absolutely wrong, it's on you. If everything goes great, it's on you. Yeah, it's not on you. That's right, yeah. <laughs> yes, one more. Also, you can have the best people, you can hire the best people, but you are, if you're mismanaging them, mm -hmm. if you're not flexible, then, they will underperform. Some people love to be told exactly what to do. You cannot be less than fair with them. Right. And they will happily do. They love routine. They love to come in every day and do the same thing or, or know at least what they need to do and they will do it. So if you are less than fair with those people, they will underperform. Mm -hmm. So as a leader, you need to be flexible and recognize each uh, employee, especially team leaders, what, how to manage the best and then manage mm -hmm. the better based on that. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay.